We're continuing today with our study through the book of Ephesians, be in chapter 6, so take out your Bible and open up to Ephesians chapter 6. Also in your bulletin, there are some sermon notes. The scriptures are there, plus a few extra scriptures we'll be looking at today from other places in the Bible. But the sermon series is developing unity in the church. I've picked out a new memory verse for today as we continue this sermon series, and this will go through the end of it over the next few weeks. This one is Ephesians 6, 11, a familiar verse to you. Perhaps you have uh, memorized this one in the past, a different translation. But let's say this verse together. It's Ephesians 6, 11. We'll say the verse as well as the reference. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. Ephesians 6, 11. Now, we'll get to that verse in a few weeks, but I wanted to go ahead and start you on memorizing that today because we understand that if Satan can destroy uh, the unity in the church, then he can destroy a local church. And I've certainly seen that happen where the unity just falls apart, the church falls apart, and they have to sell the building and it lo no longer exists. So thankfully, we are warned about that and we're given resources put on the full armor of God to take our stand against Satan's schemes, especially in his effort to destroy local churches and the unity within them. Well, today we come to part nine in this series, which is loving my parents and children at the same time. Now, some of you are in this position today. You're, you may be loving your grandparents and grandchildren at the same time, depending on how many generations and where you are in that generation. But this is a difficult task, and we're going to take a look at how to do that. I came across a funny story years ago about this idea of how children get information. Of course, if you think about it, children get information from a wide variety of resources. And sometimes they misinterpret that information, and it can mess up their whole life <laughs> until we as parents or grandparents help them to understand truth. But this story is about two young boys... Uh, elementary age, they went to a wedding for the very first time. They'd never been to a wedding before. They went to a wedding. They, they sat together. It was in their church. And after the wedding, the first boy turned to the second boy and said, did you hear what the pastor said in the wedding? The pastor said, we can be married 16 times. And the second boy said, no, he did not say that. And the first boy said, yeah. Four richer, four poorer. What were the other ones? Four better, four worse. I forgot the rest of it. That's 16. No, it's not 16. But it's amazing what kids hear and interpret when it comes to growing up and learning about marriage and about life and about family. From the television to the internet to their friends at school, kids are receiving a vast amount of information, but they need help. They need help in interpreting it. So what exactly am I, are you doing as a parent or grandparent to help our children? And whose responsibility is it anyway to teach our children about life and about family and about marriage and about friendships? Where does that responsibility belong? Well, Paul gives us some great instruction. He gives to us God's expectations for the family, for parents and children. And we find it in Ephesians 6. And this scripture points out to us that that responsibility of teaching children about God, about life, about marriage, about all things in life, it belongs to the parents. And it is the child's responsibility, we learn in this passage, to honor and to obey the parents. However, just like me, many of you, as I said a minute ago, you're caught in between. You know, you're trying to honor your parents. You're trying to teach your grandchildren. All of this at the same time, and it becomes a huge and difficult task. But thankfully, the Scripture helps us, and that's what we're going to look at today. So today we look at how unity in Jesus can apply to that parent-child relationship. We've looked at how unity applies in the church, how it applies in marriage, but today it's how it applies in that parent-child relationship. And I strongly believe that 
in the home, if we learn that idea of submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ, if we're learning that in the home, then certainly we're going to bring that same concept back into the church. So unity in the home also helps unity in the church. Let's begin by reading the scripture. I want to read chapter 6, verses 1 through 3, and we'll start with this idea of loving parents. Let's look at the scripture, verses 1 through 3. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. And he goes on, honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise, that it may go well with you and that you may enjoy long life on the earth. So looking at your notes there, look at section one with me, and let's begin with this idea of how we can love and honor and obey our parents. And then we'll come back to the next verse in verse four in a few minutes about loving our children. The first instruction here in chapter six is for the child. And Paul even quotes, as you noticed, the fifth commandment from the book of Exodus. And he reminds us that that commandment is the first one with a promise, a promise of long life. So Paul is teaching us the expectations that God has between parent and child, and he begins with the child's expectations. He says they are to honor their parents. They are to obey their parents. In general, when we think about honoring and obeying, we think of honor being an attitude, and then obedience, the behavior that comes from that attitude. So I want to begin with a definition here of honor. It's on your notes there, and it's on the slide. To honor someone is to recognize the value of that person, and then to act accordingly. This definition comes from the Holman Bible Dictionary. So this definition certainly applies not only to all relationships, but especially in the parent-child relationship. People have value by the simple fact that God created them. God gives to each of us value. That's where our value in life comes from. God created us from the dust of the earth. He breathed life into us. Therefore, we have value. All, we all have value. But when it comes to a parent-child relationship, children especially have trouble recognizing value in mom and dad. And therefore, then the disobedience occurs, doesn't it? So therefore, to remind us here, God is teaching us to obey and to honor our parents and to do so, he says, in the Lord, out of that reverence for Christ. So this instruction is taking us back to chapter 5 where he said, Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. And it definitely applies in the church, in the marriage, and in the child-parent relationship. But think about this for a minute. Why did God give us this command of honoring parents? Why did God give us this command to be obedient to parents? Couldn't he have left that one out of the Ten Commandments? No, but he put it in there, and we see it again here in the New Testament. I have three answers to that question. Why did God give us this command? It's not an exclusive all-in-one answer, but there's three ideas, and maybe it will help you. The first one is this. He gave us this command because there are no perfect parents. God didn't say, obey your parents if they're perfect. He just said, obey them and honor them. So there are no perfect parents. There are no perfect children. There are no perfect families. So God gives to us some instruction of how to live with a less-than-perfect family. The idea is we're to honor our parents. A second reason he gives us this command is because respect for authority begins where? In the home. That's where it's learned. And if a child grows up saying, well, you can't tell me what to do, if that's what he says to the parents, then he's go that child is going to have trouble later in life with other authority, like the authority of the police or the authority of a teacher or the authority of a boss or supervisor. So it begins in the home. So we need to understand how to honor, how to obey the authority of parents within the home. And then the third reason God has given us this command is because how I relate to my parents affects all other relationships. If I grow up in a home where um, my parents are mean and I'm mean and there's lots of arguing, that's going to affect how I treat my own wife and how I treat my own children. Remember, this is the first promise, or excuse me, the first commandment with a promise of long life. So if I obey that commandment of honoring mom and dad, 
then it's going to give me a much better life, a longer life, it says. But if I'm disobeying it, it's going to affect all other relationships. How I relate to my parents affects all my other relationships. With that in mind, I want to look at some ways then that we can love our parents, we can honor our parents. And I've given you three here on the notes. And these are based upon different seasons of life. And many of you know this. As you get older, the way in which you honor your parents changes as well. Here's the first one. As a child, I can honor my parents. I can love my parents by obeying and respecting them. And this is the basis of this command. We find a similar command in Colossians 3, verse 20. It says, children, obey your parents in the Lord, or in everything, for this pleases the Lord. So we looked at a definition a minute ago of honor, but what does obey mean? Obey in the Greek language as it's written here in this context simply means to hear under. So they're hearing under the authority of their parents. Children are to place themselves under the authority of parents, hear the instruction and be obedient to it and honor it. So being obedient and showing respect to our parents he says this is pleasing to God. This is God's will for the family. This is what God expects for children. Yet, in today's society, children are not only allowed to disobey their parents, they can divorce their parents. You may remember there was a court case several years ago where a child wanted to divorce the parent. Some children can't even figure out what to eat in the morning, or much less what to put on, and now they're allowed to divorce their parents. <laughs> That's not what God intended. Now, I realize there are certain situations where for the protection and safety and the benefit of the child, the child needs to be separated from the biological parents. And, of course, we have the legal system for doing that. But in this case, it's still no reason to teach the child to hate the parent. They still need to find a way to honor. Also, in today's society, we see that the breakup of marriages can force a child to honor one parent and dishonor another. Or to obey only one parent and disobey the other. But that's not what God teaches. He wants, us, he wants us to obey, to respect, to honor both parents. This is what pleases the Lord. But what about when we grow up? Now, here's a second way to honor our parents. We're no longer a child now. We're a young person. We're a young adult. As a young adult, I can honor my parents by accepting and appreciating them. This comes out of Proverbs chapter 23, verse 22. It says, listen to your father who gave you life and do not despise your mother when she is old. So when a child grows up from being a child into the teenage life and young adult life, their opinions about mom and dad drastically change. You know, as a child, we think that mom and dad are our heroes. Mom and dad are perfect. Mom and dad know everything. Mom and dad are the greatest. But then when that child becomes a teenager, what happens? <laughs> Mom and dad are the enemy. Mom and dad don't know anything. Mom and dad have too many rules, so it changes. So the way in which then we honor the parent can change as well. Just because mom and dad now have hang-ups, and now that we see their weaknesses and their faults and their imperfections, doesn't mean we can start dishonoring them. How do we honor them? We can accept them for who they are and appreciate them for what they've done. They have brought us into this world. You know, if it weren't for your parents, you wouldn't be here. As one dad said to his son, I brought you into this world and I can take you out. <laughs> That's true, isn't it? As a young person, we may not like the way our parents live. We might not like their rules, but we can accept the fact that they brought us into this world. And we can appreciate who they are and what they are doing for us. We should also accept and appreciate the sacrifice that parents have made for us. Think about all the money your parents would have if they didn't spend it on you. <laughs> you know what a father is? A father is someone who carries pictures where he used to carry money. You've heard that before, right? I also heard someone say that it takes approximately $250,000 to
to bring a child up to maturity. So if you have four children, you're a millionaire. Did you know that? They make great sacrifice. So parents are to be honored. They are to be appreciated. They are to be accepted and appreciated even when we are young adults. But now we come to a third stage of life. How do we honor our parents when we are the adult? Number three, as an adult, I can honor my parents by caring and providing for them. 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 4 gives us the instruction. It says, if a widow has children or grandchildren, these should learn, first of all, to put their religion into practice by caring for their own family and so repaying their parents and grandparents. For this is pleasing to God. So now it's time to pay back that $250,000, right? That your parents spit on you. But eventually, yes, there comes a season of life where there's a role reversal in the parent-child relationship. Again, as a child, our parents are our heroes. As a teenager, our parents are the enemy. But as a full-grown adult, we're not sure what to do with mom or dad. They're getting older. Their, their health is failing. They don't have as much money as they used to. What does God's word say? God's word says, put your faith into practice, caring for and providing for your parents. Honor them while they're still alive. Many of you perhaps are in this particular situation, and I encourage you that if God has instructed you to be caring for your elderly parents, which he has here, he's going to provide the resources then for you to do that. God doesn't give us laws and instructions and rules and then back away and say, now you figure it out. <laughs> no, he helps us. I watched my own mom and dad care for their elderly mothers. In fact, my dad and my mom brought my maternal grandmother into the house with us. And I've talked to you about that before. So she lived with us for about seven years. So they took care of her. So it's never easy. It's never um, an easy decision even how to care for parents. But God provides for us to carry out this instruction. Caring for our family and repaying our parents, repaying our grandparents. Again, this is pleasing to God. It's pleasing to God to obey the parent when you're a child. It's pleasing to God to care for them when they get older. But for those of you who perhaps are really struggling with honoring parents, maybe you were abused as a child. Maybe you were abandoned as a child. Maybe you grew up in a foster home. I don't know. There's probably a variety of situations here. And you're struggling with the idea of being obedient to this command, to honor mom, to obey dad. Well, Psalm 27, verse 10, it's not on your notes, but I want to read it to you. Psalm 27.10 says this, Though my father and mother abandon me, the Lord will receive me. Other translations have forsake. Though my mom and dad forsake me, the Lord will take care of me. He will receive me. So we need to understand that no matter what has happened in our past as a child or young adult or a teenager, God will receive us. He will take care of us. He will adopt us through our faith in Christ as his child, adopt us into his family, and he will take care of us. At the same time, God doesn't want us to hide the abuse we've had. He doesn't want us to sweep it under the rug or repress the pain. God doesn't want us to blame our parents or fake a smile when we talk about mom and dad. He wants us to deal with it openly and honestly. The Bible says if someone has sinned against you, go to that person privately, what? And talk about it. Confront them. I've had to do that in my own life with my own dad. I've had to go to him and talk about sin in his life toward me and how it affected me. And it was much better in the relationship when I finally did that. So if you're in that position, remember, God will help you in some way to honor your mom and dad, even though there was a lot of dysfunction and maybe even sin in your past. Though my father and mother forsake me, the Lord will receive me. So we have several ways from Scripture that we just looked at of how we can love and honor and obey parents through all seasons of life. 
Now look at section 2 on the back of your notes. What about the command for parents and how do they love their children? The second command is Ephesians 6 verse 4. There's a negative part and there is a positive part. Look at four, verse 4 with me. Fathers, do not, do not exasperate your children. Instead, bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. So here's a great truth from this passage. The God-given authority for parents is not for their own self-centeredness and ego. That God-given authority for parents is for the benefit of the child. It's not for the selfish gratification of the parent. So I hope that puts it into perspective for you. I don't think uh, any parent would welcome all that God has given us for selfish gratification, but some do. We want to do it for the benefit of the child. I've got two ideas here, two ways then to love our children. And the first one is this, number one. Loving children involves us teach, encourage, and discipline my children rather than infuriate them. The negative command there in Ephesians 6 is do not exasperate your children. Other translations have do not provoke your children to anger. As I put it here on your notes, I use the word infuriate. infuriate. I can say it, almost. And the reason I use that strong word, don't infuriate your children, is because of what was happening in the day and time that Paul wrote this. The Roman government had a rule, a law, that allowed the dad in the family, the father figure, to have total and absolute authority over his family. The father could sell any child into prostitution or slavery. He could kill anyone in his family. And no one would question that. The Roman government law allowed the father to have absolute power of life and death over his own family. He was accountable to no one for how he treated the family. In fact, there became a practice in that day and time where a newborn baby in the family would be brought before the dad. And if the dad picked that newborn baby up, then everything was okay. The baby could stay in the family and in the house. But if the father rejected the baby and walked away from it, then the baby would be put out on the street and the babies would be gathered at the end of the day, taken to the town forum and be sold into slavery and into prostitution. That was legal in that day and time. You think, how in the world did a government get away with that? Well, they did. That's what they allowed. Even though we are not under Roman law today, and I don't think that law still exists today, there are fathers that still abandon their children, and they refuse to take responsibility for obeying the scripture of teaching and training the children in the ways of the Lord. Here are some ways we do this today. Here are some ways that we infuriate our children and provoke them to anger. We overprotect them. And it infuriates them. We show favoritism over one child over another. We push our children for achievement beyond what is reasonably expected. We fail to let them grow up at a normal pace. We use love as a tool of reward and punishment rather than just loving them for who they are. And then, of course, there's the obvious, the physical abuse, the verbal abuse, the sexual abuse, the emotional abuse. All of these behaviors provoke children to anger. And we wonder why are, <laughs> they, they don't love the parent anymore. But rather than fall into these behaviors, what's the instruction? Bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. Well, what does that really mean? On your notes there, I've stated it in this way, teach, encourage, and discipline children. That's a, a several different words of what the scripture is trying to say here. For perhaps another word would be mentor. Mentor your children. That's kind of a lost art here in America. We don't think of mentoring others anymore. We just say, go get a job. You know, there it is, go out there and get one. But the idea of mentoring them. Just before my firstborn daughter... I didn't know a whole lot about parenting, so I went out and bought a book. 
And the book, is I put it there on your notes, it's called Leaving the Light On. It's still available on Amazon. It's by Gary Smalley and John Trent. And the whole idea is, at some time or another, you've said this to your children. Well, they'll go out, and what do you say? I'll leave the light on for you. That's what this book is about. It's about bringing your children up in such a way they will want to come back home because you've left the light on for them. But in that book, it gave five ideas for mentoring children. And I've used this with my own children, and I want to share with you, share them with you. It's called Master Mission Methods Maintenance and Mate. So the first idea is, whom am I going to live for? I want to teach my children that or teach your grandchildren that. Who is my master going to be in life? Am I going to worship God and Jesus? Or am I going to worship my work or my money? We want our children to worship Jesus and let Jesus be their master. And next is mission. What does God want me to do in life? We need to help children with this, this decision. Because if they don't know, they're just going to go off to college and spend your money and come back home four years later and still not have a clue of what they're to do in life. That doesn't make sense, does it? But yet, my wife as a professor t will tell you, it happens all the time. Help your children answer that question. What does God want me to do in life? Number three, methods. How will I fulfill my mission? And I have taught my children, look, I want you to figure out what God wants you to do in life and then find a college that will help you to accomplish that or find a job that will help you to accomplish that. Let them understand or help them understand what their mission in life is first and then look for a way to be trained for it. Look for a college or a tech school or whatever to be trained for that. The fourth idea is maintenance. How will I evaluate and adjust my methods? You know as well today as I do that you don't get a job and keep that job for 40 years. We change jobs quite often now. It just happens. It's the way life is. Sometimes the company folds. Sometimes we get laid off. Sometimes we get fired. So we have to be w willing to do maintenance and adjust and evaluate our methods. And then finally, mate. Help your children in the decision process of choosing a mate. And here's why. The scripture says, do not be unequally yoked. Why? Why does the scripture say that? Because if you take a man and a lady and put them together in marriage and they don't agree about who the master is and what the mission is and what the methods are, then they're not going to stay together very long. They have to be equally yoked, not unequally yoked. So help your children and grandchildren understand they need to think about that before they get married. Does this person I am going to marry agree that Jesus is our master and that God has a mission for our life and he has the best methods for our life. They need to agree on all this. So these are some ways we can bring our children up in the instruction and training of the Lord rather than infuriate them. Now here's a second idea. Number two, how can I love my children? I can pray for them. Now those words are not in the scripture, but in this process of training our children and bringing them up in the instruction of the Lord, prayer is certainly a part of that. And how do you pray for your children? What should you pray for your children? Well, one of the things I pray for my children, I pray over these five M's. I've been teaching them about master and methods and mission and maintenance and mate. So I pray about that. And I pray about their future mate. I pray about their future education. I pray about their spiritual growth in the Lord. There's many different ways of praying for children. And I encourage you to pray for your children. Right before each one of my children were born, <clears throat> I wrote them a letter. Not knowing uh, what they would look like, what their name would be, if they were a boy or a girl. I wrote them a letter saying how excited I was to see that little picture on the ultrasound and how excited I was to be a dad for them. After they were born, I wrote them a second letter saying things like, now I know what you look like. Now I know your name. And here's what I promised to do. And I promised each one of my children in a letter this verse to bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. And on those letters, I had them framed and I gave them to them when they were old enough. So there's a, a picture of both letters with a picture of the uh, ultrasound of them in the womb and a picture of their little baby picture. And that's all framed for them. But then 
When they turn 18, I write them a third letter. And the third letter says, I have fulfilled my promise. Now you're accountable to God. <laughs> there are different ways, creative ways that you can think of, and I'm sure like I have, to help your children grow up in the world, to bring them through the instruction and training of the Lord, whether it be a grandchild or a child or a great-grandchild, do it. Be obedient to this verse to love your children. Now we come to the summary of this passage. This is the ninth key to unity. And the ninth key to unity is this. Exercise unconditional love toward my family. And I emphasize the word exercise. <laughs> this is hard work, isn't it? Being married, having children and grandchildren, loving our parents, loving our children all at the same time. It's hard work. It is exercise. And we cannot neglect it. It is an unconditional love. But this unconditional love is needed in the family and it brings about unity in the family that will help also the unity of our congregation. My invitation today to all of you is this. I challenge you to love your parents and to love your children. Why? Because this fulfills God's expectations for the family. Will you join me as we pray about this? Father, thank you for our parents and grandparents. Thank you for our children and grandchildren. Thank you for all of our extended family. Help us even today as we seek to love all of those in our family, be they parents or grandparents or children or grandchildren, and to do all this at the same time. Help us as we seek to care for elderly parents. Help us as we seek to care for great-grandchildren and to bring them up in the instruction and training of the Lord. Help us, Lord, as individual families to be obedient to your commands that we find in this scripture, to live them out in such a way that it does please you. And we pray for your help to do this and accomplish this all in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.